everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pam Croak. I'm the CEO here at the Bucks County Association of Realtors, and I am just thrilled to offer a very special edition of our Zoom Power Hour. Today, we have with us Dr. Lawrence Yoon, who is the chief economist and who oversees the research group at the National Association of Realtors. He supervises and is responsible for a wide range of research activity for the association, including NAR's existing home sales statistics, affordability index, and home buyers and sellers profile report. He regularly provides commentary on real estate market trends for NAR's 1.4 million realtors. Dr. Yoon received his undergraduate degree from Purdue University and earned his PhD from the University of Maryland at College Park. And I thank Dr. Yoon for taking time from his very, very busy schedule to speak with us today. So I'm not gonna take any more time. I'm gonna hand this right over to Dr. Yoon. Thank you, doctor. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Pamela, for uh, inviting me uh, to share some of our thoughts on the economy of uh, real estate uh, with the realtors from Bucks County. Uh, I was, uh, my wife and I were doing sort of driving around, you know, like an extended day trip or overnight trip. Uh, and we were up in Bucks County earlier part of the year, you know, what a great uh, location uh, next to the river, I guess, Delaware River. Uh, even uh, just driving along the river was pleasant. And uh, I think we had a um, meal in Hope or New Hope, uh, I guess, uh, you know better than I do. Oh. Uh, but, you know, a great location, and I see why, uh, you know, people want to uh, settle uh, there. Uh, anyway, uh, this uh, this year, uh, as everyone knows, market condition has been... Dr. Yoon, you're muted all of a sudden. Sorry. Uh, the sales uh, this year has been a little tough. Uh, the sales activity has been down roughly 20% year to date uh, compared to one year ago. And it is well below pre-COVID, uh, which means that people in the business, realtors, uh, mortgage lenders, title companies, uh, top time out there. One interesting part of the current housing cycle is that your clients, your past clients who purchase home with you, two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, they are smiling. Their housing wealth has risen. Last week, Federal Reserve came out with the, the total uh, wealth condition between homeowners and renters. Sizable difference with the typical homeowners wealth now reaching about 400,000. And of course, older household would have more wealth compared to the youngers, because younger ones still have the mortgage to pay down. Uh, but the renters barely have 10,000. So you look at 10,000 for renters or typical renter versus nearly 400,000 for typical homeowners. It shows the long-term value, long-term wealth accumulation potential for homeowners. So quite a contrast. People in the business, tough time but your clients are all smiling, uh, which means that perhaps you want to contact your client just to say hello, because they're in a good mood, so that if they encounter, whether family, friends, business colleagues who need a real estate service, they can definitely quickly refer over to you, knowing that they are in a happy mood. But uh, right now, tough business environment, as you know, because of much higher mortgage rate condition, uh, and let me go over as to what the outlook for mortgage rate would be. Of course, everything is subject to error. I'm giving my best uh, perspective of how I see things developing. Uh, so let's start with by putting the PowerPoint slide onto the screen. And I will be sending this PowerPoint slide over to Pamela, who will then distribute to people who want it. Uh, so if you want to look at the number a little more carefully, it will be available. So let's start. Mortgage rates, 20 year high, that is the top line condition. So I'm showing this graph only over the past four years from 2019, right before COVID, right before COVID. And you may say essentially a normal time uh, to the recently, 
but the top line, the red line, would be the highest in over two decades. Uh, mortgage rate essentially reaching closer to 8%, especially uh, last week. It ticked higher uh, last week. So what is the cause of this increase in mortgage rate, and when can it go down? Well, you see the line on the bottom, blue line. Certainly, that has an impact on the red line, similarly moving together. The blue line is what the Federal Reserve in Washington controls. So they are trying to help the economy in both, the, in both trying to stimulate growth and trying to contain inflation. So the blue line shows that Federal Reserve when all in when COVID arrived, great uncertainty, great unknown. So out of safety, let's lower the interest rate to zero in the blue line. That zero interest rate is not for you and me, but for the banking system. And in the hopes that the banking system borrowing rate, rate being low, perhaps other interest rate could also decline. And it certainly did. Mortgage rate declined to 3%. Credit card loan uh, rates decline, business loan interest rate decline. So many of the interest rate also follow that path. Some of your clients may have locked in at 2.7%. I mean, those are incredibly generous uh, interest rates. But if you look towards the end, blue lines are rising very rapidly, thereby pushing up the red line. So increase in the interest rate by the Fed has definitely brought the mortgage rate to their 20-year high. In fact, this increase in interest rate by the Fed, you can say were really the most aggressive policy by the Fed in a generation. I mean, one has to go all the way to early 1980s. Some in this audience may not even have been born uh, in the 1980s. Uh, but we have to go back when the Fed aggressively raised interest rate. Certainly, it surprised even the Wall Street uh, when the Fed raised interest rate by 75 basis points in one go. I'm using a little technical term, but essentially, usually rate hikes would be in a quarter basis. You know, just think of the quarter, the coin, but they were essentially doing it three quarter at a time, uh, which even surprised the Wall Street. So mortgage rate, very high harming the real estate transactions. But there is another reason why interest rates are at 20 year high. The America the Beautiful, go along the Delaware River, river. Uh, many, you know, you, know you, you go across the Grand Canyon, Niagara Fall, landscape clearly beautiful. But even our way of living, American way of living is also beautiful. But one of the Wall Street rating agency essentially said, America is no longer beautiful financially. You look at the financial situation of America and it is no longer beautiful. So how do they come to that conclusion? Well, this is the line on federal budget deficit. The red line shows the tax revenue coming into Washington. So on April 15th, you submit your check that money comes to Washington uh, and also for people on payroll every two weeks, some money comes to Washington. So the red line shows that tax revenue, but the blue line is how much government spends. And what do you see in the chart is that generally speaking, in most years, government spends a little more than tax revenue. And in fact, it's a little bit above tax revenue until you see towards the second half where it tends to be a little large. And then if you hone in on 2020, when the COVID arrived, huge, huge budget deficit. Because not only did the Federal Reserve went zero on interest rates, the federal government said, here's money, money available for people, because again, great uncertainty, we don't know what's gonna happen, but that led to huge budget deficit. And you may say, that was justified because we were stuck at home. We didn't know what's gonna happen. So you may say that was partly justified. Well, we are now out of the pandemic. You are going to the shopping mall, you are going to the restaurant, yet spending levels still are elevated as if we are still in the midst of a pandemic. 
So this large budget deficit is what the uh, rating agency is concerned about to say that, look, if this was not America, you look at this graph and say this was Mexico, or you say this graph was Vietnam, it will be downgraded significantly. Just because you are America does not mean automatically you get AAA rating all the time. So just as a light warning on the fiscal situation, tax revenue government spending perspective to say that, watch out, we are feeling a little uncomfortable about this large budget deficit. Last year's budget deficit, two years ago, three years ago, you add up all the budget deficit of past years and you have a national debt. And national debt right now is 100% of GDP, something that World Bank, IMF would say, look, that is a banana republic. We cannot have a 100% debt to GDP ratio. So again, uh, the part of the extra increase in interest rate, and I don't know exactly, no one actually knows, some economist wants to make a guess, is it a decimal point? Is it a two decimal points above what it could be if we didn't have this large budget deficit? So something to get under control. Uh, maybe, you know, just last week you had a client who got a mortgage rate for 7.8%, very high. But maybe the mortgage rate could have been not 7.8, but 7.5% if we had a much better budget situation than what you see on the chart. Another implication of this chart is what's happening in Washington at the House of Representatives. The Republican Party showing circus activity uh, in terms of not able to choose the Speaker of the House uh, but one of the reason contention as to why they want to choose person is to say, look, we have to get serious about this budget deficit. So how do we get there? What kind of speaker of the house do we need to get there? So that is also partly related. And in less than a month, there will be another showdown, government shutdown uh, issue. So when government shuts down, well, homes that require flood insurance, you're not going to get mortgages. So that home transaction would be postponed uh, if there is a government shutdown and it will be in a less than a month when that discussion again arises. So this huge budget deficit, we have to address it, but somehow the seriousness, now get the Speaker of the House, let's try to negotiate, let's try to get a compromise, Democrats, Republicans, to somehow address this budget deficit downward over a long period. Maybe we cannot do it in a single year. In fact, it is impossible to do it in a single year, but at least have a plan to sort of steadily uh, to bring down the budget deficit. So we have high interest rate, and what is the impact of high interest rates? Well, we are seeing in lower home sales. So realtors are hurting, mortgage lenders are hurting, title insurance is hurting. This is generality, because when I speak with some realtors, some realtors are saying, believe it or not, I am having the best year ever in my business career. Good for them. I don't know how they do it, but even in a down market, there are always some realtors who can really pull it off. So I do hear from times some realtors saying this is the best year ever, but you look at the statistics, many realtors are hurting uh, because of downward trend in home sales. People involved in commercial real estate transaction, trying to sell that little retail space. Well, commercial transactions are down 50% from just two years ago. So that uh, sector is also hurting. Home prices, generally speaking, are holding on or still rising, but not commercial real estate prices. You want to sell an office building, you better do a big discount, 20% reduction, 30% reduction. You want to sell an apartment building. Well, you say it's high occupancy. You know, people are paying rents. But if you want to sell the building, you have to reduce the price. And the reasoning is in commercial real estate, it is short term loans, not 30 years, seven year loans, five year loans. And those loans need to be refinanced and they are being forced to refinance at very high interest rates. So they are saying in order to make the numbers work, if I have to sell it, if I want to find buyers, I have to lower the prices. So commercial real estate prices coming down. Community bank in a huge mess. 
uh, I would say, uh, broadly speaking, there are about 5,000 small size banks uh, across the country. Half are probably in a healthy condition, but other half, 2,000 or so, uh, could be in a very difficult condition, which means that if you are getting a business loan for your own business from a community bank, the community bank may be a little more hesitant to lend it to you because uh, they are very concerned about their balance sheet. So why are the community bank in a uh, balance sheet condition? Something called interest rate mismatch. Essentially, now they have to pay the depositors much higher interest rate. Put your money in my bank and we have to pay you 3%, 4% to keep your money. Certificate of deposits. Yet the investment that community banks have done, like commercial real estate, is only returning uh, low interest rates. So therefore, you, know, you are borrowing high, community banks are borrowing high, and they are lending at low, or they already lent it at low, so that interest rate mismatch is hurting. Also, community banks have larger exposure to one weak sector of the economy, commercial real estate, which further harms. So if you have a business loan from community bank, again, understand why they are a little more hesitant to uh, lend you, renew some of those loans uh, because of this hurt. And I put this because as I go into the future slide later, I will explain how this all plays into interest rate policy by the Federal Reserve. Another impact is we are seeing some economic slowdown not a recession, but job creation is a little lighter and lighter with each passing months. There's still many help want to sign in many, many uh, companies, uh, but those help want to sign a little less than what it was, say, six months ago or one year ago. So we are seeing some economic slowdown. Uh, and also the interest expenditure on federal debt is now beginning to rise. Just like you have a credit card debt, they raise interest rate, well, you're going to pay more. Government has a huge debt, 100% of GDP. Now, at higher interest rate, they have to pay money on those interests. Who? Well, it could be a grandmother who bought U.S. Treasury bond. It could be Pennsylvania Teachers Union who invested their pension fund uh, into government bond. It could be Chinese government who purchased U.S. government debt. So whoever is owning, they are receiving little higher interest payment and uh, based on all the numbers, it looks like uh, you, some of you may be shocked by the, what I'm going to say next, that national defense spending in the upcoming year could be less than the interest payment that we pay. Uh, so high debt along with high interest payment, we will be paying more in interest payment than all the salary for the soldiers, money that's spent on military jets, or Navy uh, aircraft carrier. So it looks like uh, that's the case. So damage coming from high interest rates. Home sales down, all the way down to the last point, interest payment being very, very high. So let's look at home sales specifically. So this is the home sales trend with a line in the middle as March 2020 when COVID arrived. So before COVID, when our life was normal, home sales increased 3%, decreased 4%, and we made a news out of it. But in hindsight, that was not a news. That was a very stable condition. Because post COVID, you see the huge fluctuation in sales. First, the lockdown. I'm not sure why, but Pennsylvania governor was the last to reopen the economy. Realtors were trying to explain, look, we can do open houses. Please let us do open houses. But the governor said no. Uh, so in other states, they could do open houses, but not in Pennsylvania in March, April, or whatever time period that you are aware, aware of. So during that period, sales collapse. You cannot go out of the home. But once the, the economy reopened and you were let go to say, OK, you can go about your business, there were buyers of homes lining up. Mortgage rates were at historically low point, 3% mortgage rate. Some renters were saying, look, I'm paying $1,500 per month for my rent, but if I was to buy a home, monthly mortgage payment could be even lower than that, so they want to take advantage. Another part, 
Well, people could work from home, so they don't have to be so close to downtown. Whether downtown Philadelphia, downtown New York City, people say, you know, if I don't have to come to downtown, maybe I can go out into the suburbs uh, and maybe less crowded area because I don't want to catch uh, the COVID. I don't want to be part of the pandemic and uh, escaping from the city is a better chance. So home sales really boom, especially in outer suburbs, resort areas. Uh, so home sales really flew along. And then Fed began to raise interest rate. They began to uh, further raise interest rates and you see the sales declining, declining, declining. I thought that early part of the year, maybe we could get a recovery, but then Fed raised interest rate again and then sales went down. So we are bouncing off these cyclical low in home sales. Current home sales are matching back to 2010 levels. Some of the newer agents may not know, but people who have been in the business for a long period would know that 2010 was the foreclosure crisis. Home listings everywhere with no buyers. Well, currently the sales activities are matching that. With one big difference, we don't have foreclosure crisis. So uh, home sales, just bouncing along the low on the cyclical low points, damage from the higher interest rates. This is home builder sales. So I put it, uh, it the line in the middle again, March 2020. Uh, in fact, it's a little bit offline, so I need to readjust that line a little. But it's supposed to be March 2020. But essentially, it moved very, very similarly. Before COVID, very little movement. Post COVID, big swings. With one big difference, Realtors are hurting, but home builders are now beginning to cheer. Home builders are saying, we are back on our feet. So if you look at the data towards the end, you see some increases. Furthermore, the year to date sales on newly constructed sales are actually up by 2%. If you look at some of the big home builders, Toll Brothers, KB Homes, Lennar, their stock prices are up 50%, 60%, 70% from one year ago. There's a great optimism in Wall Street over home builder companies. So what is going on here? Home sales through the multiple listing services are down 20%, but the builders are up, even though slightly somewhat up uh, compared to before, with the Wall Street willing to provide more funding for the home builders, uh, given their high stock prices. So what is going on? Well, the next chart will show you what is going on. It is inventory. On the left hand side is inventory showing up on the multiple listing service. On the right hand side is home builders inventory. So the size of the market is dominated by existing homes. Existing homes are about 90% of all transactions, 90% of the inventory. That's where you do most of your business. Now, some of you may be working with builders, so you do have exposure to some builder activity. Good thing that they are paying buyer commission. Builders are saying, bring your client, I'm gonna pay commission to the buyers. I don't understand this lawsuit about the buyer, uh, why buyers should not be represented by the realtors because consumers want professional assistance, yet the court is saying maybe uh, consumers should not be uh, given that opportunity, which doesn't make sense. But irrespective of that, the builders right now, they can just build empty homes and create an inventory. It is insufficient compared to the total market, but from builders' perspective, just builders' perspective, they have relatively high inventory and they produce. Maybe they have to do a little price discount, but they're still a profit margin and they're doing the sale and they're making money. So builders are doing better than realtors because of inventory availability. Now we know why inventory on existing homes are so low. Your clients are loving that 3% and they don't want to give that up. So if they have to hypothetically move across the street, same neighborhood move across the street, their monthly payment would essentially double for a similar size home, so they don't want to move. And we understand that, which is the reason why 
uh, NAR, our leadership, and talking with policymakers and many people, by the way, some uh, realtors from Bucks County are also participating in NAR committees, research committee at the regional vice president level. So good thing that Bucks County is also uh, providing a lot of good input to NAR. But one of the input that all through all this committee work is that let's try to boost inventory by doing some policy changes. One that has a better chance of a passage once the House of Representatives get back into the business of governing, start doing legislation so that eventually bill get passed, go to the White House, get signed. And we have a bipartisan uh, support on the following issue. Raising the capital gains tax on a sale of a home. Remember, you told your clients, buy a home, and when you sell in the future, you don't pay tax because for a single person, you have $250,000 exemption. For a married couple, half a million dollars. You know that, you buy a home, and when you need to sell, trade up, you sell your home and you don't pay tax. But guess what? Price of home has risen that some homeowners, or I should say, in fact, a good number of homeowners in Bucks County may have exceeded that limit. So it's good that their home prices have risen, but psychologically, they don't like the fact that if they have to make a sale, they have to pay capital gains tax. So psychologically, they don't wanna list the property aside from the low interest rates. So can we move the capital gains exemption a little higher? Because you think about what was the last time we had this capital gains exemption figures. It was 25 years ago. This figure has not been changed for 25 years. What was the price of Coca-Cola 25 years ago? What was the price of Big Mac? What was the price of movie uh, tickets 25 years ago? Well, this $250,000 and half a million dollar exemption has not been changed for 25 years. So we are asking, and both Republicans and Democrats are essentially uh, saying, yeah, that makes perfect sense out of fairness. Maybe we should index to inflation. So your past clients, when they make a sale, they don't have to pay a tax. So maybe we get a little more listing to the market. The other second policy, which has a difficult time in trying to pass, but nonetheless, we are in communication with members of Congress and congressional staff is to say, you know, we have some small time mom and pop real estate investors who may have four investment property, eight investment properties, not BlackRock, who have hundreds and thousands of uh, single family rental property, not, not the big guys. So put some condition, small time investors who have less than 10 investment properties. If they meet that criteria, and they're willing to unload one or two property onto the market, then they don't have to pay tax on that uh, sale of a home. Uh, because as an investor, when you sell it, there is a capital gains tax. So again, some kind of relief on capital gains tax and make it temporary and make it conditional. If only if it is sold to a first time buyer or to say that you, know, you cannot sell it to another real estate investor so that we have more inventory coming onto the market. So we are in discussion. I would say the chance of that passage is much smaller uh, compared to the capital gains exemption on primary homes, uh, but at least we're in communication because we want to have more inventory coming onto the market. Uh, things like commercial buildings, empty commercial buildings, turn it into residential units, condominiums or adult housing, it's gonna take time, it's not immediate. But tax policy changes, can have a more immediate impact, short-term impact to it. Uh, Bucks County housing data, I went to the website, very good that Bucks County Association is able to provide you with very detailed information. And this is just one select page. There's many, many pages. As you go to the website, review uh, what is available. Uh, but what I see here is that the new listings are down 14.7%. No surprise, people do not want to give up their 3% mortgage rates. The pending sales are down 9.7%. So at least it's in a single digit percentage, not the 20% declines, but at least single digit percentage in pending. Uh, but the closed transaction is painful, down 28% from one year ago. 
uh, you know, it's the closings where you get your commission checks. So that is not really uh, you know, in any good numbers. So still down. And the median home prices are down 2.2% from uh, one year ago in this transacted uh, prices. And you can uh, see much more data uh, in the website. So higher interest rate is causing harm to many sectors of the economy, especially real estate. So why is the Fed raising the interest rate to begin with? Well, let's start with a fourth grader question. So you may have a son or daughter or maybe a niece and fourth grader that will ask questions something like the following, which adults, it never occurs to adult. Why does the Federal Reserve exist? That's a very good question. Why does it exist? Because it did not exist at the time of George Washington. It did not exist at the time of Abraham Lincoln. Why the heck does the reason for Federal Reserve? It was created in 1913 when academics review all the historical, historical data to say it would be good to have a central bank in the country with two main purpose. First purpose is to say that if there is an economic slowdown, let's help the economy. So that's the first purpose. And the second purpose is to say that dollar will be a dollar. So you have a dollar and it would retain that spending power. So that would be the goal. Last summer, you went to the and you said, what happened to the dollar? Because everything was more expensive, dollars simply could not buy as much. Inflation was running close to 10% summer of last year. Good thing that now the inflation is much calmer, 3.7% lately, it's not yet down to 2%. 2% is the Federal Reserve desire inflation rate. So it's not yet 2%, but at least it's trending downward. So the reason why the Fed raised interest rate is to say, look, we made a mistake. Our job is to keep the dollar as a dollar, but somehow, you know, inflation went up to uh, 9, 10%. We feel embarrassed. And in order to correct for that, they are raising interest rates. But when you look at the textbook, people who study Econ 101, they would note that when Fed raises interest rate, the impact to the economy takes time. Fed has already raised interest rate multiple times. Stop doing it and let's wait for how the economy responds. Because I think the inflation rate will be going down if the Fed was to stop doing it. So if the Fed continued to raise interest rate, they would be overdoing it in my view. They're overdoing it. So stop raising interest rate right now and let's see how the inflation will play out because I think inflation will go down. If we look at the specific items on inflation, the you know, headline is 3.7%, uh, everything combined. But if we look at specific item, let's start from the bottom. Airfares are a little cheaper. Medical service, I don't know whether you would agree or not, is down 2.6% from one year ago. Close up 2%. New car up 2%, electricity up close to 3%, gasoline is up 3% from one year ago, food prices still uncomfortable 3.7%, then you come to 7.3 and 7.4. What is that? Lodging away from home, things like hotel, living at dormitory, or Airbnb. Those are rising at 7.3% and rents are rising at 7.4%. You may be asking the question on rents. Could you say, well, last year I had a tenant and I could raise rent by large amount. But can you do that right now? Can you, if the rent is coming for renewal, can you raise it by another 7%? And I doubt that is the case. And the reasoning is there's so much apartment construction across the country. You look at any construction crane, whether in New York City, Philadelphia, Charlotte, North Carolina, Austin, Texas, when you see a construction crane and wondering what are they building, most likely they are building apartments. So we have a massive apartment construction, yet rents are still rising. So it's inevitable that you cannot raise rents strongly in the future months or in the upcoming years. But the rents are rising and rent, I put it in the red to say it is the heavyweight. It is the big weight. 
Price of eggs may get all the media attention last year, but it is insignificant. What is significant is rents, and rents are still rising very strongly, which counters the logic of so much empty apartment construction that is happening. On the very top, car insurance, I just put it there because you drive and you have to pay car insurance, and that is an outlier. It's rising at 19%, huge increase. And why is that? Well, they said in the, in the car repair shop, they don't have much workers. So maybe uh, in America, we are focusing too much on sending everyone to college. Maybe we need to send people to community uh, colleges or a trade school so that we have more people who can repair things, fix things, and make things rather than people who just read books. So something to consider uh, regarding the shortage of the uh, uh, people working in the repair shop. But the other thing is something that is happening in many big cities. I'm in Washington, D.C. I see it. Philadelphia, I'm sure it's happening. You see it in Portland, Oregon. You see it in San Francisco, which is teenagers are running around and smashing car windows to see what's inside. Well, that's going to cost money. So even if your car is not damaged, we are all paying for it in terms of higher insurance. So. I just simply don't understand, you know, they get arrested and they get released and they tell their friends, we got released and they bring up more friends to, uh, to participate in smashing the car. It just doesn't make any sense because we want to provide a proper direction for many teenagers, disadvantaged teenagers on the better path towards life uh, by just letting them do a smashing car window. I mean, that is not the future that we want to see. Um, but uh, the car insurance a little bit an outlier and again even though your car is not damaged you are partly paying for it uh, because of the uh, situation so let's go more specifically on the rents so this is an apartment construction that's happening across the country right now it is close to 40 year high in terms of apartment construction activity so logic would imply so much apartment construction rents should calm down. And in fact, if you look at private sector data, not government data, private sector data is saying that rents are now rising by only 2%, not 7.4%. So rents are rising at only 2%. Rents have calmed down according to the private sector data. Let me put this graph along with official government statistics. Here it is. Rents, according to the private sector, is coming down. According to the government, it's still high. Well, the Federal Reserve is looking at the blue line, not the red line. Maybe there is a lag time. Maybe the blue line will eventually follow the red line. But one thing is clear. Rents simply cannot rise this strongly in the upcoming months. I think it's going to calm down. So as the rents calm down, that is going to make the consumer price inflation much calmer. And if that's the case, then the Federal Reserve can cut interest rates. Remember the job growth is a little sluggish. So by cutting interest rate, that will be helping the economy. So uh, let's hope that blue line follows what they are seeing uh, in the private sector data. Home prices are important for your business, your clients. But believe it or not, it's not part of the consumer price inflation. So, and the reasoning why it's not part of the consumer price inflation is uh, the government essentially said stock prices should not be part of the consumer price inflation because that's an asset. Same thing for gold prices. Likewise, houses should be considered as an asset and therefore it should not be included. So it's not included, but it's important for your business. Let's look at how the home prices have been doing. If we look at the repeat price index, not the median price from the uh, MLS, but repeat price index is to say same house that has been transacted so we get a better uh, same type of home transactions. What we are finding is that in the West region, home prices are coming down. Home prices are a little lower in California, uh, coming down in Las Vegas, but on the Blue color states, including Pennsylvania, prices are still higher compared to one year ago. So according to repeat price index, not the median price. So it's showing that. But if you look at what has happened from pre-COVID to the latest, 
all states are positive. All states are positive. And in Pennsylvania, it shows 37.7%, meaning that home prices, typical home prices in Pennsylvania has risen by 37% in three years uh, since the uh, onset of the COVID. Um, so uh, homeowners doing very, very fine according to this data. If you are wondering which state is doing good, dark blue states. So Florida is doing well, state of Maine is doing well, uh, Idaho, Montana is doing well. So dark blue states would be doing even better, but every state with big increases. Home price appreciation, again, repeat price measurement, not the median price. Uh, this is the trend uh, in the Bucks County, Montgomery County, Chester County, so I guess they just excluded the city of Philadelphia. Uh, and you see the price appreciation from year 2000, it was rising at 5%. Then it over blew due to those subprime loans, bad mortgages, and then it blew up. And then we had a foreclosure crisis in the middle with price declines. And then prices began to be more normal, 5%, and then you see the huge boom. But this huge boom is not a uh, leading indicator for any potential price decline uh, is just reflecting that we just did not have enough homes. And good thing that we don't have subprime lending in current cycle. All the homeowners have good mortgages, so you don't have to worry about it. But the price increases are beginning to be diminished. Uh, but, but I don't see it going negative, uh, you know, maybe mildly negative as possible. Uh, but and not any big declines, or you may even stay in positive range. So price appreciation in the three big counties surrounding uh, Philadelphia. High mortgage rate is also leading to more cash transactions. So people who are not bothered by the mortgage rate, these are cash transactions. Maybe older households who may want to trade down, they sell their expensive home, trade down, buy all cash or people who are escaping from big expensive markets in New York City, and they say, you know, I'm, I wanna go live in Bucks County since I don't have to go to Manhattan every single day. Uh, and they said, I'm gonna buy all cash. So that's a possibility. So cash getting more uh, interest. Distressed property sales, minimal. Newer agents, there was something called a short sales, which was massive in 2010 period, short sales. So, if you're wondering what a short sales were, well, I can only say it was a big headache or realtors will say it was a big headache. You don't have to know what a short sale is because we don't have any distressed properties in the current market condition. So good mortgages leading to good outcome related to the uh, distressed property numbers. Let me now turn to the job market and then go to the forecast. So with each passing month, we are adding more jobs on net. So there's always some job cuts, but there's job addition. So what is the net? Net is still positive, and 4 million more Americans are now working compared to pre-COVID. So you see at the beginning, job losses during the lockdown, but after the lockdown, job creation that happened consistently. So 4 million more Americans working, because eventually, in order to buy a home, you have to have a job. Of course, high mortgage rate does not help, low inventory does not help, but we still need jobs to assure that we have a healthy housing market. If we look across the country, you see Pennsylvania with 2.2%. So what is that 2.2% for Pennsylvania? It is indicating that there is 2.2% more jobs in Pennsylvania today, more people working, 2.2% more people working today now compared to March 2020, right before COVID, 2.2%. This is a payroll data, people receiving W-2 statement salaries, nurses, teachers, people working for companies, they're receiving W-2 statement, not realtors. Most realtors are independent contractors. Your income fluctuates a lot, but among those people receiving steady income, how many more jobs? 2.2% more jobs. If you look at New Jersey, New Jersey is doing slightly better, 3.6%. But Pennsylvania is doing better than New York State. New York State is up only 0.2%. In fact, the fast job creating states are mostly in the South. 
Florida, 8.8%. Texas, 8.8%. So Pennsylvania, 2.2%. Looks a little light uh, compared to some other states, but it's doing better than New York. It's better, doing better than Connecticut, uh, in, at least in this uh, data among the uh, northeastern states. If we look at specifically in the Philadelphia metro market, which covers the suburbs, so from year 2000, interestingly, in this long-term graph, from year 2000 to 2015, that 15-year time span up to 2000 to 2015, there's no job creation in your area. Then from 2015, things started to go up all the way right before COVID. You see the job creation. And then COVID hit, knocked away the jobs, but now you are at new record high. So compared to year 2000 to now, one is looking at you know, more than 100,000 additional jobs in the Philadelphia uh, region, 100,000 jobs. How many people can watch the Phyllis place in the stadium? Well, it's less than 100,000. So you can say more than a stadium full of people with jobs uh, out in the Philadelphia region. So at least this would provide support for housing demand. Lower interest rate means bigger housing demand. More inventory means even more transaction possibilities. So at least job numbers uh, look uh, uh, decent or respectable in your area. So here's my forecast. It's been a difficult year in the statistics, but I think the mortgage rate are set to fall. Maybe I am being a little too optimistic here. So when I say mortgage rate to be near 6% by early spring, I'm looking at maybe 6.5% because right now it's 8%, but if it goes to 65 I mean, that is a big cheer for the industry. Why do I make this forecast? Well, I'm not pulling the numbers out of a hat, but there are some logics. First logic is I think the rents will come down. That is the big heavyweight component of this consumer price inflation. And once that comes down, Federal Reserve can cut interest rates. So I think the Fed will begin to pivot from raising interest rate to stop raising interest rate to cutting interest rate as we go into next year. So that's first reason. Second reason is with each rate hike is hurting the community banks. So I think the Federal Reserve do not want to hurt the community banks more than what they have already uh, experience. The last point is something more uh, esoteric, technical. Uh, most government, most mortgages have government government backing, meaning that Veterans Affairs mortgage government backing, FHA government back mortgages by your mortgage broker get sold to Fannie and Freddie. Fannie and Freddie is government back. What does government back means? It means that if somehow the veteran cannot pay the mortgage someone who lent that money will still get the money back by the government. So there's no risk in lending for mortgages knowing that it is government backed. And because of that, mortgage interest rate tends to be a little bit above government borrowing rate. The safest borrower in the world is U.S. government. So right now the U.S. government is paying something close to 5% uh, in interest which means that under normal spread, under normal spread, mortgage rate today should be 7%. If the Fed cuts interest rate, then we're going into the sixes. So I think the spread currently is very wide, but once it returns to normal spread and you combine that with cutting of the interest rate, I think we can get mortgage rate something in the six and a half percent range by early spring. What happens when the mortgage rate goes down? Naturally, you're gonna have more buyers. That's good. So you're gonna have more buyers, but something unique in this housing cycle. There will be more sellers. I mentioned about tax policy changes and so forth. Maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't happen, but if the mortgage rate goes down, automatically, I think we will have more sellers. Why? Well, let's look at what happened in the past two years when your past clients refused to sell. But life change. In America, there are 7 million newborn babies. Where are they sleeping? If people do not trade up, are they sleeping in the kitchen? And people will say, no, you know, we have to trade up. They need a larger size home. They don't want to make a move when the mortgage rate is 8%. 
But when the mortgage rate comes down to six and a half percent, they begin to say, you know what? We have to get a larger size home. I know we are giving up 3% mortgage rate, but life moves and we need a larger size home. There are 3 million marriages, one and a half million divorces, 7 million Americans turn 65. They want to trade down, yet they have been postponing. 4 million deaths. I mentioned about 4 million new jobs, but underneath the 4 million net new jobs, there are 50 million job switches, people switching from one company to another. 50 million Americans with different commuting patterns, yet their house is all the same. So I think as the interest rate goes down, we know we will have more buyers, but something unique is I think we will begin to have more pent up sellers coming onto the market, more sellers, more buyers, that is a market. You get a market when you have both more sellers and more buyers. So I think that things will play out uh, better. And my last slide is this. So this is the nationwide home sales forecast. 2023 is very difficult. This year is difficult. But next year, things should be improving. The blue bar is new home sales. So if you only focus on the blue bar, home builders would actually do better this year compared to last year and continue to improve. But the big one, existing home sales through the multiple listing service, that will really begin to show an increase next year. So that is my forecast. Of course, you know, forecast is just that. We really don't know the true outlook for the future. But based on how I see the inflation coming down, with the inflation coming down, the Federal Reserve changing their policy while lowering the interest rate, that will lead to lower mortgage rates. Lower mortgage rate bring more buyers and more sellers to the market. So just hold on and let's see how the market plays out uh, as we go into next year. So thank you very much for inviting. And I think I have time for maybe uh, two or three questions. Uh, so let me look through the chat and then uh, look into it. Or Pamela, if you can uh, read through it and just uh, can answer maybe one or two questions uh, before wrapping it up. There is just one question in the chat. And the question is, uh, since COVID, the COVID spending was high by the government because of the, the, um, the stimulus payments, et cetera. The question is, why is government spending still so high? You know, wh what are we spending our money on? Uh, you know, you have to ask that question. Maybe you one can look in line by line items. Uh, but some of the, uh, you know, the things like um, uh, the tax credit for having additional child, I think that was introduced during COVID that is still in place. Uh, some of the spending for uh, like the food stamps, uh, you know, was elevated during COVID. And I think only recently, I think only about one month ago, they began to reduce that amount just a, a little bit. Uh, and then you have the geopolitical, you know, activity that's happening across the world. Uh, but I don't know exactly how everything uh, uh, aligned, but yes, we are out of the COVID, yet the spending level uh, still appears as if we are still in a COVID. Thank you. Another question came in. Do you think we will miss a recession in 2024? Thanks. So, uh, you know, if the interest rate remains this high or if the Fed makes a mistake and do another rate hike, we could easily go into a recession. Community banks are really suffering. Uh, and even, you know, we need to build more homes. But did you know construction loans are now becoming 11 percent, 12 percent to borrow money to buy lumber and other things? So even the home builders uh, may begin to feel the pain. Uh, even in a low interest rate environment. So I think uh, if the Fed overdo it in the rate hike, uh, another rate hike, we could certainly go into a uh, job cutting recession, which would be a terrible condition for the country. Uh, one last question. Uh, do you have a forecast for home prices through next year? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, so, you know, uh, nationwide, I really don't see any meaningful change in prices. So it would not surprise me if the prices were 4% above uh, one year ago. So I'm looking at in 2024, prices rise another 4%, or if it declines 4%. But I don't think we're going to get into high single digits, you know, plus 8% or minus 8%. I don't really see that. So it's really about price negotiation between buyer and sellers uh, out in the marketplace. 
so it's going to be much more very stable uh, home prices. Okay. Uh, do you think the Fed will do one more quarter point rate hike before it pauses? And once it pauses, how long do you expect it to stay flat before finally starting to cut the Fed uh, rate? Uh, so Federal Reserve constantly mentioned they are data dependent. They want to see the data before acting upon. Uh, and um, there are things I would say overly hawkish, meaning they want to raise interest rate, but they also understand if they raise interest rate, it's going to hurt the community banks more. So I think uh, the Fed will be, uh, so my best forecast is no rate hike, no further rate hike. And then they will begin to see that data coming in in early spring, inflation is completely uh, calm and that will permit the Federal Reserve to cut interest rates. Uh, I did not mention all the big banks. Big banks are not in trouble. So Bank of America, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, they're not in trouble, not because they have better managers, but because they've been warned about higher interest rate. Uh, you know, I don't want to create a conspiracy theory, but uh, you know, the, the reality is that big banks have to meet with Washington regulators frequently, and the Washington regulators do something called stress tests. And the stress test is to say, JP Morgan, let me see your balance sheet. Hypothetically, if we were to raise interest rate like this, can you handle it? And if the JP Morgan cannot handle it, the Washington regulator will say, no, readjust your balance sheet because you cannot handle a higher interest rate. So Washington regulators and big banks, they undergo stress tests. So big banks were prepared for higher interest rate. It's that small banks were taken by surprise, uh, left in the wind, hanging. Uh, so that's why I think uh, out of fairness, Fed cannot continue to raise interest rate and further harm their small size banks. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, and I just I just hope that uh, your words go into the ear of the Fed. <laughs> That's what we can hope for, right? Thank you so much, Dr. Yoon. We really appreciate your time and your effort on our behalf. And uh, I thank all of you for attending. We, are, we did record this. This will go out to our membership and uh, keep an eye out for that and keep an eye out for additional power hours coming your way uh, through, through the end of the year. Thanks, everybody. Take care.